be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, he says, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And if you read the parallel of this in the book of Colossians, instead of saying be filled with the Spirit, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And the outcome of the word of Christ dwelling in you richly is the exact same thing that we find here. No difference. That's the reason why I started with the story of Gideon, how the word caused the transformation in his life. And for us as born again Christians, it's the same thing. First Peter says, you're born again. Now you're born again. We, we just we read a portion of it. I, I just didn't want to progress in that direction initially. Begotten again unto livelihood. Then he said, you're born by the word. And a few verses on in, in First Peter 2. And, hey, what did he begin to say? Cry, crave as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. That you may grow thereby. That growth, growth, spiritual growth, is marked by a progressive surrender of your desires and your will to the Holy Spirit. How does he do that? Through the word. Opens the eyes of your understanding to see. Then your conduct changes. So he says, um, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So the Holy Spirit corrects the weakness in the, in the will. How does he do that? You know the Bible says in the book of Philippians 2 and verse uh, 13. That God is at work in us, both to do what? To will. That is him taking over. That is him influencing your will. Both to will and to do. Pause inside you the hunger and the craving. To move in the direction of God. And every child of God. Because you have the nature of God. When God breathes his will into your heart. It excites your nature. It's who you are. You want to move in his day. You want to satisfy God. And so just as we looked at Thanksgiving. Uh, last week. We're going to look at submission. Today. Let's look at this. From verse 21. It says, uh, King James Version, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Actually, rightly, this should have been translated submitting one to another in the fear of God. For the purpose of this study, I want you to understand that 21 is like a, is like a subheading. And from verse 22, they began to itemize this heading. The heading is submission. So it says, submitting, King James says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. In the fear of God. So looking at both the Greek and uh, English definition of the word submission, um, and, and this verse, I've taken these five things, so you can pay attention to this and just write them down if you want to. One, submission is a fruit, is the fruit or a fruit of God's nature in man. It's a fruit of God's nature in man. Now, any heart that is meek and humble 
In any heart that is meek and humble, you will find a submissive spirit. This is point two. In any heart that is meek and humble or humble, you will find submission or submissiveness. Three, the submission is a voluntary ranking under. It's not forced. The voluntary ranking under. Four. The grounds for submission is the fear of God. The grounds for submission is the fear of God. I've done some studies and looked at a few places um, in the New Testament, which I will run through today before we close. And um, I discover that all this is true. We'll find them clearly revealed. Webster Dictionary defines submission as one. The act of yielding to power or authority. The act of yielding to power or authority. It also defines it as, this is the second definition, as um, surrender to the control or government of another. Surrender to the control or government of another. It practically means the same thing, but just express different words. Three. It means obedience. Compliance with the commands or laws of a superior. So if we take time to look through scriptures, you will discover that the Bible, the Bible will never say or make a demand for one who is in authority to submit to one who is under his authority. Even that is contrary to the definition of the word submission. And here he is talking about the behaviors of God's children. Their conduct. And don't forget where we started from. Be followers of God as their children. So now he's talking about us following him in our interpersonal relationships. And here he broke it into three different divisions. But I will add a fourth one which I picked from the book of First Peter. So he says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then in verse 22, he started with the relationship between a husband and a wife. Started from, from that. Because you see, that, that's the, is the foundation of the human society. You see, when, after God made man on planet earth, the very first interpersonal relationship that any two humans had on planet earth, was within the context of the marriage union. And so that makes her the highest. And so I'm not surprised that it started with that. So it started by that, and within the context of that relationship, it says this, it says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, and it takes two. To be in that relationship, a man and his wife. In that relationship, see again, looking at the definition of the word so far, hypotasso, which is the Greek word from which all of this is derived. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says that the husband is the head of the wife. Authority. And so the demand of submission was given not to the one in authority, but to the one who was under authority. Now 
let me start by saying that to be in authority does not make you superior to the one under authority. And in the relationship between a husband and a wife, we don't relate on the basis of who is superior. There's no superiority. We are equal heirs of the grace of God. Equal heirs of the grace of God. But in the union, there is a head. And the head is the man. And so it says here, it says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church. Let's look, go to chapter 6. The next relationship. Because I said I wanted to treat submission as a whole. The next relationship, it says, children. Obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. So in the relationship between parents and children, children are to submit. Because they are under the authority of their parents. I was sharing this with somebody some time back. I said, well, you know, the world says when a child is 18, hey, you're already an adult. After all, you have a right to vote. And when you are um, 21, you are a full adult. You can take charge of your life. You know? So I was having this discussion with somebody. And I said, well, okay, let us see this. The Bible says that Jesus... Uh, God left us, he, Jesus left us an example that we should follow in his steps. At the age of 12, Jesus Christ went to the temple to preach. And then the parents went after him and got him and warned him not to try that again. You don't break free from us and go do this all by yourself. And Jesus said, yes, ma. Yes, sir. And then the Bible says, that for 18 years, Jesus was subject to his parents. 12 plus 18 is what? 30. Where did the world get 18 from? Where did they get 21 from? You don't even qualify to be a priest until you're 30. In the Old Testament days. Say, ah, pastor, just leave that one, leave that one. Yeah. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. That it may be well with thee. And thou mayest live long on the earth. And then for fathers to the children, he then said, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Now we're going to talk on the flip side later, but not, not today. Now I just want to deal with submission. So in the first relationship between a husband and a wife, the wife should submit to her husband. In the second relationship spoken about here between parents and children, children submit to their parents. And then there's a third relationship, which you find in verse 5 of chapter 6. It says, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. Employees, obey your employers. And it says in verse 6, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ. Bringing it back again to what we're talking about, the grounds for submission. The grounds of submission is not the conduct of the one in authority that inspires it. The grounds for submission is the fear of God. Because you honor him. Wives, submit to your husbands because you fear the Lord. Children, Submit to your parents because you fear the Lord. Workers, 
Submit to your employers because you fear the Lord. A spirit-controlled wife would do it. The spirit-controlled child would do it. The spirit-controlled worker will do it. 1 Peter 2. I already explained this a little bit. The new believer should desire the will of the Lord. Then he tells us who we are in Christ. And then he tells us not to mess around with sin. In verse 10 he says, Which in time past were not a people, but now we are the people of God, defining who we are. And in verse 11, it forbids us, the same way we find in the book of Ephesians. In chapter 5, same thing he's saying here again. He says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against your soul. Same thing. And then in verse 12, he says, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles in the world, among the unbelievers, on the unbelieving, that whereas they speak, against you as evildoers they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God not immediately they will say they speak of you as evildoers the day your good works will speak and they will glorify God he says it there in the day of visitation which means even if they keep calling you an evildoer, you keep manifesting the good works that you know will eventually bring glory to God in their lives. And then next thing he starts talking about is submission. It's a clear manifestation of the leading of the Spirit in the life of believers. Submit unto God. So in verse 13 he says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake. So the basis for submission, again, is your fear of God. That's the basis, that's the grounds for submission. It's your fear of God. He says, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men in well-doing. This is the will of God. You may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Verse 16, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as servants of God. Then he goes on to say, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Again, still talking about the powers that be, as it were. Servants, be subject to your masters. With all fear. Be subject to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. The grounds for submission is your fear of God, not the behavior of the master. I don't know if you're following this. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, hey, you've done, you, you did something bad and you're punished for it, and then you take it, you know, you take it well. He says, you have not done anything that you should glory about, or there's no honor in that. You did wrong when you were punished for it. Well, you took it well. 
For what glory is it? If when ye be buffeted for your faults, hmm, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer, and you suffer for it, ye take it patiently. He says, this is acceptable with God. You see, the, the one that he says acceptable with God is when you do well, right? And you suffer for it. And you take it patiently. Now, he's talking to servants. He's talking to those under authority. The attitude that we who are under authority must have true authority. And no, this it runs through every aspect of our lives that may not even have been mentioned here. Our attitude to authority. First within the house of God. Then at home. In our interpersonal relationships. In your place of business. Your workplace. A Christian must be distinguished. The child of God must be distinguished. There are certain things that are right. There are certain things that are not right. In the book of Colossians chapter 3, it says, Wives, submit unto your own husband as its feet in the Lord. Feet in the Lord. For it becometh you. So when we talk about the pleroma of the spirit, don't think that it goes only into laying hands on people for them to receive power of God and things like that. It has nothing to do with that really. But has everything to do with the development of your character. What sort of person you become after you know the Lord. These are the crucial marks. Our attitude to authority. And you know, whether you are a husband or you are, what is it called? You are under some authority or the other. So it extends to you as well. What is your attitude to authority? A child of God must be exemplary in this area because it is a fruit of the influence of the Holy Spirit in the life of any man and you will find again even in First Peter 3 that God was saying to the woman submit not because of the man for here you find a situation where the man does not obey God he says, but you do it because you want to honor God with your life. The grounds for submission is the fear of God, not the behavior of the authority that is above you. It's the fear of God. If the Spirit of God takes dominion over your life, you will respond in the fear of God. In these matters. God bless you richly. And I pray that in our journey to develop our character and become like Christ. That we will all receive understanding from the spirit. And be meek to make changes. The changes that are required. Mm -hmm.